we've got a city cam report and testimony from a blood expert in the steel murder trial. And a 90-foot stack comes tumbling down at the old arena. In sports, Jim has a landmark decision in baseball. Dick checks weather toward the weekend. Emmy Award-winning City Camera News is next with those stories and a report tonight from Bob Franken and a chewing out of the Cleveland School Board. We are Television 8, WJW-TV, Cleveland. From Television 8 in Cleveland, this is City Camera News with Jim Hale, Jeff Maynard, Jim Mueller, and Dick Goddard. Good evening. It was a real SOS at the Blue Water Seafood Company in Brook Park. Thirty plant employees were taken to hospitals when they were overcome by what seemed to be carbon monoxide fumes. The workers were taken to hospitals, most of them treated and released. Kathy Bibbins was one of the first to get sick. About two minutes after I got there, I just started getting like I was running and running. I was so tired and I couldn't um, breathe. And so about a quarter day, I took an aspirin. I got a real bad headache and I took aspirins. And I come back and I sat down and I got real dizzy. And the girl in front of me, she caught me and they made me put my legs between my knees. And your head then, between your yeah, knees. my head between my knees. And then they just carried me out. A foreman carried me out. What was what about the other employees that were, you were working on the line with? Um, about two minutes later couple more girls come into the uh, infirmary and then they just said they just started passing out on the line people was falling off of their chairs and everything now tests show some of the people did have carbon monoxide in their blood but company officials say testing devices inside the plant showed no dangerous levels of carbon monoxide in the air a blue water has that testing equipment because people have become sick from carbon monoxide fumes here before through the day, the air cleared. People were back to work on the afternoon shift. Also in Brook Park, some city employees are still not working, and Jim has that. On one side of the dispute in Brook Park are the striking service workers and dissident firemen and policemen. On the other side, the city council members, and at issue is money. The service workers, who among other things collect garbage, have been off the job a week. Trash in the community is piling up at the rate of 60 tons a day. The service workers contend the council has reneged on agreed-to contract provisions. The safety forces, meanwhile, are still deciding whether or not to begin their own strike. They say that Mayor Angelo Guido okayed an 8.8% pay hike, but council later ruled that excessive. Separate meetings were to be held today. Well, in Ashtabula, striking teachers and other school employees are still walking picket lines in spite of a court order to get back to work. That strike is one week old now, and right now the two sides there are getting together for a court-ordered negotiating session that is open to the public. That meeting's at the Ashtabula School Kitchen Center. Here in the city, about five dozen employees of the financially troubled Muni Light Plant will very soon be off the job, but not by choice. The plant is getting out of the power generating business and switching to only a distribution system. And thusly, 57 workers very soon will be getting pink slips. Some will be offered uh, jobs in other city departments. For the rest, though, it's tough luck. Around Muni Light today, we found some gripes on the way the firings have been handled. I could have appreciated it, uh, being the first to know because of my situation, my status. It bothers me that we got to work day by day. Like on a humble, I mean, that always bothers me. Can't go do nothing. You know, we're just hanging. We don't know what's going to happen yet. They, will, they won't come out here and tell us exactly what's going on. There were also complaints that the workers found out they were being fired from reports in the news media. Well, it looks like all systems are go for the Perry Nuclear Power Plant. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says all safety-related standards have been met. And within two months, the commission is expected to have a decision on granting full construction permits for the plant, which could be in operation, turning out atomic power in five years. Well, it was progress of a different kind at the old arena building on Euclid downtown today. The demolition of the once-renowned sports palace is right on schedule, and crane operator Fred Dunlap was right on target with his 6,000-pound wrecking ball. The 90-foot tower here was part of the ammonia system for the ice house, and it probably took weeks to build. It took about 10 minutes today to level. 
The total teardown job here should be completed in another couple of months. We've been told that almost everything is being salvaged. Up next, we've got updates on the Steele and Leach trials. And a stormy day in court on school desegregation. A murder trial of former Judge Robert Steele and the Kilbane brothers for plotting the murder of Steele's wife Marlene shifted its focus today from the defendants to the testimony of a prosecution witness, an expert on blood. And City Camera's Jim Cox is here with a report. For 37 years in the coroner's office, Mary Cowan has been examining the aftermath of violence. Blood, fragments of bullets, bits of clothing, particles of hair, anything that might be evidence of a crime. Ms. Cowan testified about examining the body of Marlene Steele at the morgue a few hours after Mrs. Steele was murdered while asleep at home. Also about what she found at the Steele home the next day. She said tests showed Mrs. Steele was shot twice in the head from a distance of between one and two feet. The explosive force of the bullets splattered blood as far away as seven and a half feet from the body. What may be more critical as evidence, however, is the blood that remained on the body. The prosecution contends that it will show Robert Steele told police that when he rushed into the bedroom, he shook his wife, trying to determine if she was still alive. Ms. Cowan's expert testimony, however, was that if the body had been pushed or shoved, the flow of the still wet blood would have been distorted. Ms. Cowan said there was no distortion of the blood flow. Tomorrow, more, more testimony about the relationship between the former Judge Steele and Mrs. Barbara Schwartz, whom he married three months after his first wife's murder. Jim? Thank you, Jim. In another Cleveland courtroom today, Ashby Leach was given permission to act as one of his co-counsels. The Vietnam vet is charged with kidnapping and extortion, stemming from his takeover of the Chessy headquarters in Terminal Tower last August. Also today, an appeals court has partially lifted the gag order issued by Judge Eugene Sawicki, who was hearing the Leach case. Because of the legal maneuvering in the trial, which opened this past Monday, a jury has yet to be seated to hear the evidence for and against Ashby Leach. City camera reporter Bob Franken told us last night to look for fireworks in another courtroom today at an important hearing on city school desegregation. And from the federal courthouse, Bob reports it happened that way. We had expected some tough talk here today, but the legal battle in the federal courthouse over school desegregation in Cleveland escalated this afternoon. As the hearing began, the NAACP pulled a surprise and filed a motion asking that Cleveland School Superintendent Paul Briggs and all but one board member face charges of contempt of court at a hearing one week from today. There were strenuous arguments from the lawyers, but the strongest comments came from Judge Battisti, who gave what has to be called a tongue lashing to the Cleveland school board members he'd ordered into court. Repeatedly, he accused the board of trying to, quote, undermine the court's desegregation ruling in what he called an attempt to intentionally manipulate the people's emotions. Further conduct like that, he concluded, would result in contempt citations, in his words, surely and swiftly. Then Judge Battisti abruptly adjourned, and it became clear afterwards his anger was not lost on school officials. Mr. Sweeney, will you talk to us, please? No comment. No comment? Dr. Briggs, will you talk to us, please, and give us your comment? Why won't you comment, sir? So are you afraid to make any public comment right now? I really am. As for the motion for the contempt of court hearing, Judge Battisti failed to rule on that. It is still pending, and maybe that's why the school board members were so reluctant to say anything. This is Bob Franken, City Camera News at the Federal Courthouse. And it is time again to meet a Thursday's child who, according to the old saying, has far to go. A youngster with lots of love, but no home. This evening, Jim Fennerty introduces us to Michael, a Thursday's child. When I asked Michael if he'd rather pitch or catch, he said pitch. If you miss the ball, you have to chase it. Well, I did talk him into catching later, but Michael impressed me as a boy who knows his own mind. One of four children, Michael came into county care when both of his parents died. Since then, he's had several placements, the latest on a farm, where Michael is an integral part of his foster family. In fact, when we sat down to talk, that was all Michael wanted to talk about, especially how he takes care of the calves. I take care of nine calves. Oh, and some cows and some pens and some calves and pen that they don't get any more milk. So, um, and I help feed them. And I help get them in. What's the best part? Help getting cows in. You like to round them up? Yeah, you get them in their stanchions. And then you milk them? No, yeah, yeah. 
first you give them their hay and then you milk them. We found Michael to be a bright, intelligent young man, but he's a young man who needs a real family. We found Michael to be a bright, intelligent young man, but he's a young man who needs a real family. Social workers say he's apprehensive about adoption. Nothing has ever lasted for long in this boy's life. You could turn his life around. If you're interested, call the Community Information Services at 696-4262. I'm Jim Finnerty, City Camera News. Coming up, a report on a beautiful day for the wearing of the green and following the green stripe. Boy, it sure was, and we've got more City Camera. As Jim said, we had a fine day for the wearing of the green. Thousands of people crowded downtown streets to watch the city's 110th St. Patrick's Parade. The Marine Corps Band from Cherry Point, North Carolina, led off the parade. Area high school bands and floats and leprechauns followed along. And everywhere you looked, people were having a good time. The official estimate is 50,000 people turned out to watch. There was a lot of competition to find the best vantage point. And on the reviewing stand today, watching the parade, was an honored guest of the parade officials, a dedicated man who has spent most of his life downtown. And we get the story from City Camera's Neil Zerker. Well, the intersection around 6th Street in Superior just won't seem the same. Patrolman Joe Dura, who has walked that beat for 28 years, retired today, ending 33 years on the force. This afternoon, prior to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, of which he was an honorary marshal, Joe and I took a last walk around his old beat and reminisced. The one thing the police department lacks is communication, and that you can't put in the computer. I wish we had enough of men to put on every corner they have here in the downtown area. But even as the parade passed him by today, Joe Dura was not saying goodbye, only so long for a while. And there'll still be a Dura on the police force, Joe's son, patrolman Don Dura. Neil Zerker, City Camera News on Superior Avenue. Nationally and internationally, we have been following these stories today. President Carter's visit to West Virginia, where he attended an energy forum. He talked of an inevitable shift from oil and gas to coal as a main energy supply. And the chief executive supplied his own energy by chowing down on a cheeseburger in the employee's cafeteria in the West Virginia State House. And for Cuban Premier Fidel Castro, a state visit today, he arrived in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And we'll have details on these stories at 6.30 as our news hour continues with the CBS Evening News. <laughs> Mighty big development in baseball today, and Jim Mueller's got it coming up. A landmark decision for the future of baseball. That's what Commissioner Bowie Kuhn is calling Judge Frank McGar's ruling in his favor in that lawsuit filed by A's owner Charlie Finley. Of course, Charlie sees it a little differently. You know, I've been in baseball uh, a little over 18 years now, and uh, I can't help but feel in a way that uh, uh, maybe, and I say maybe, there's 18 years of sweat, blood, and sacrifice uh, down the drain. Pending the appeal. It would seem that Bowie Kuhn's position has been enhanced by this decision. Well, uh, I, it would appear that way, John, but uh, since uh, he will realize very quickly that we're following an appeal, I don't think that uh, he will continue to be as brave as he has been in the past. He'll just have to wait and see himself. The Indians won another Cactus League game this afternoon. Larvell Blank slammed a three-run homer to help the Tribe beat the Milwaukee Brewers 14-7. 19-year-old Wayne Webb is still showing the way in the $75,000 Muriel Open after three rounds. Despite opening today with a 179, Webb regrouped to build his lead over Jim Godman to an even 200 pins. The field of 192 has now been cut to 24, and they'll begin head-to-head -head match play tonight at 7. Heading into that eight-game block, veteran Dick Ritker is in third place. Dick snapped a two-year victory drought last week, and that has his adrenaline flowing. Definitely does. You know, the money in the bank counts and frees up your swing a little bit. But I had bowled bad for two years and just kept working every week at my game, trying to perfect and bring back the little things that made it good. And last week was the culmination. Uh, made the TV show and then won in one game. 
Now they tell me that uh, you might be contemplating retiring from the Pro Bowling Tour. Has the victory changed your mind on that? Not contemplating. I am going to definitely retire from what we call full-time participation. I'll probably only bowl four or five tournaments next year, spot the tournaments at bowling centers where I feel I have to go back because I've got friends, personal friends in the game and so on. But I'm going to devote most of my time to professional instruction. The Cavaliers will host the Houston Rockets tonight at the Coliseum. Of course, the last time out, the Cavs were 31-point losers to the 76ers, but that was two days ago. Well, it's difficult to put over our minds, but it's something that uh, we can learn from, certainly. I think uh, we had a bad game ahead of us somewhere. It's been a tough, uh, tough road towards the end of the season, and I think we needed something like that to wake us up. And the toughest part is ahead of us now with San Antonio and Houston coming in this week. Other than the obvious factor of being uh, a physical strain, what's it like to play four games in four nights? It's pretty tough, especially when we don't play mall at home. You know, we have to travel to New York on Friday. So uh, we've been preparing ourselves all along for these, this tough uh, part of the schedule, so I think we'll be ready for it now. More trouble for the Cleveland Barons. Former general manager Bill McCreary is firing, the, or rather suing, the team's owners for one, or rather $3.1 million for slander and breach of contract. The Barons are off tonight after losing to Buffalo 6-2 to two at the Coliseum last night in front of their second largest crowd to date, nearly 12,000. Rick Hampton didn't score for the Barons against the Sabres, but he has had a hot stick since Coach Jack Evans moved him from defenseman to the wing. Fred McLeod asked Rick if he likes the wing or would prefer to switch back to defenseman. You find yourself you're running around a lot. Well, it doesn't really matter. It's up to Jack. If Jack wants me to play on the wing, uh, I'm happy there. And if you'd like me to go back on the fence, I'm happy there too. So it doesn't make much difference to me. But as far as the adjustment has been... Uh... Has it, you know, been a situation where maybe game after game it gets a little bit easier? Yes. Yeah, so well, you know, it's it's tough to change from one position to the next, especially in the middle of the season. And uh, if I come in next year and I play left wing, I'm going to find it that much easier going through the season. Maybe I'll score uh, um, 10 more goals than I did this year playing on the wing. Now that I'm, a, I'm used to it. The NCAA Wrestling Championships got underway this afternoon out in Norman, Oklahoma, and Cleveland State's Ron Varga defeated a guy named Phil Mueller, no relation, in the 167-pound class to advance to the second round. George Foreman and Jimmy Young will tangle tonight in San Juan, each hoping for a victory that will move them a step closer to Muhammad Ali's heavyweight title. Foreman has been tabbed a solid 3-1 to one favorite. On the Pro Golf Tour, the play, uh, Tournament Players Championship is underway today, and it's Tom Watson and Don B. sharing the early first-round lead. Both had four under par 68s today. And now, Jim, you're on the tee. Okay, thank you, Jim. And Dick, thank you for a nice day on behalf of all the people who marched in the parade. Sure. You're welcome. We had 43 degrees on this uh, St. Patty's Day. You might think, gee, that's a little chilly, but that is the actual average high for this state. And we seldom meet averages. The day we did had a wind chill factor, made it seem a lot colder. After midnight, we'll have some stuff falling on our heads, and I'll tell you what we can expect in a minute. Our weather system's right on schedule today. We had the sunshine, albeit a rather chilly day, with a high of 43. The wind chill factor gave us the equivalent temperature uh, closer to 20 degrees. Last night, I had indicated that this would be our day of 12 hours of daylight and 12 of darkness, our equinox... Uh, before what is actually the vernal equinox. Don't pay attention to what that dummy told you last night. <laughs> On Sunday, the vernal equinox occurs, and uh, at 12.43, winter ends and spring begins. And spring is going to begin with uh, some snow up in the northern part of the Great Lakes. I don't believe uh, we are going to get anything in the way of an important snowfall here. We are still waiting for the last snow of the winter season. We always get one uh, in mid or late March. That is not in sight tonight, although the low-pressure area that uh, at 1 o'clock today was located out here in the Midwest was creating a very extensive cloud deck that was moving into the state of Ohio, and we have clouded over in many areas of the state now. I would feel if you're driving tonight, you have no weather problems until after midnight. It is raining in Indiana. It is raining in Illinois now. And all of this ahead of a storm center deepening over Nebraska, causing one to three inches of snow from, well, northwestern Nebraska up through Minneapolis. Minneapolis already has had two inches of snow. This low is going to track northeast, should be in the state of Michigan during the day tomorrow. I mentioned the problem last night that is still there. Temperatures are going to be gr very critical tonight in the northern counties of Ohio. Precipitation after midnight could begin in your area as rain and or a mixture of rain, light snow, or sleet. But I feel it would end and turn entirely to rain by early tomorrow morning as the air is brought up from the south. 
The whole system moving east of here by tomorrow night, putting us back into some rather chilly air for the weekend. Uh, golfers, uh, tennis players, I don't think you're going to like uh, the temperatures here Saturday, uh, although they will be very close to normal. In the deep south, it is very warm today, and it was a fairly cool day, but a dry day out in the far southwest. The whole system moving east of here by tomorrow night, putting us back into some rather chilly air for the weekend. Uh, golfers, uh, tennis players, I don't think you're going to like uh, the temperatures here Saturday, uh, although they will be very close to normal. In the deep south, it is very warm today, and it was a fairly cool day, but a dry day out in the far southwest. State of Ohio now with clouds enveloping uh, nearly all the counties and a wide range in temperature. 33 at Hopkins now, yet 47 at Akron Canton, 54 is deep in the south. 43, 27 officially today, 26, 19 a year ago. Sunrise tomorrow, 635, sundown at 637. And the air pollution today was in the satisfactory level at 71. It is 38 degrees on the shoreway here, 62% humidity, barometer 29, 92 on its way down. Winds northeast 12 tonight, turning south and 18 and gusty tomorrow, very windy. Cloudy, rain overnight, could be mixed with snow briefly, 32. Then tomorrow, a cloudy, a windy, a rainy day, but very mild. The high 55 early in the day, the cold front coming through late tomorrow afternoon. Turning colder, lows tomorrow night, 30. May have a few scattered flurries late on Friday night. Saturday, mostly cloudy, cold, scattered flurries, 42. Inland, 36 against the lake, so pretty snappy. Jeff. Well, maybe it'll be winner's last stand. This evening, we have a Television 8 guest editorial. Here is Cuyahoga County Commissioner George Vordovich. In his guest editorial on the People Mover last week, Assistant City Law Director Nick DeVito argued that if Cleveland does not use federal money allocated for a downtown People Mover, it will go to some other city. As a responsible public official, this argument never makes sense to me. First, I feel we must act responsibly when it comes to federal spending. When the federal government is offering to send back some of the federal tax money out of our own pockets, provided we throw in an additional $10 million in local monies for a project whose same benefits could be achieved by an upgraded loop bus system at a fraction of the cost, I say no thank you. Secondly, I have written President Carter and our Ohio congressional representatives stating the cost-heavy people movers are a misplaced priority in light of the many serious problems facing our cities. I have asked that the entire people mover program be canceled and that those funds be reallocated to the capital improvement programs of our nation's suffering urban transit systems. Our elderly, our poor, those seeking employment, those hundreds of thousands who take public transit to work or shopping need a reliable, low-cost, countywide system, not an expensive gimmick downtown whose costs and benefits are questionable. filed today by Ohio Democratic Senator Howard Metzenbaum shows that he and his wife Shirley have a net worth of $3.65 million. Metzenbaum inserted the item in the congressional record on the eve of a Senate vote on an ethics package. 20,700,000 shares, the average price of a share of common stock to date, lost three cents. And that's City Camera News at 6. Tonight at 11 o'clock, Bill McKay continues his week-long series on the police SIU division, investigative division, with a look at what's happened to fingerprints since the days when G-men were boyhood heroes. That's part of the news that's new tonight, and I hope you'll be with us. And if you've been out celebrating St. Pat's, drive carefully, walk carefully as you go home tonight. <laughs> Stay with us now for the CBS Evening News. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening.